So we're continuing the series in 1 Corinthians called Messy Church, uh, where we're looking at how God's grace meets us and transforms us in the midst of and in spite of all of our mess so that we can be the broken, messy people that he uses to bring his grace to others. And we're in this section of the book where um, Paul's been doing Q&A with the Corinthians. They, they sent this long list of, of questions, things they didn't understand, of theology that they were distorting. And he's been responding question by question to, to all of the concerns that they had and all of the heresies that they had. And, and it's been tough sections. It's been hard questions that he's wrestling with. And now I feel like um, Paul is kind of breathing a sigh of relief as he gets to come to an easy question. And, and for them, we'll see throughout this chapter, it's a little bit of a hard question. They're wrestling with the question of the resurrection. Did, did, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Will we um, be raised from the dead, we who are in him? And, and deep theological questions like that. But for now, um, again, I think Paul is just taking a deep breath and he's going back to his bread and butter, to the, to the teachings that he loves. And he's simply reminding this congregation that he loves of the hope that we have in Jesus. He's, he's declaring the gospel. He's reminding them of, of the resurrection of Jesus and of its implications for our lives. So I just want to read the passage as we get started, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it a bit. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and, and that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. This morning, we're looking at our need for reminders. We're looking at the message and its witnesses, and we're looking at all that we have and all that we are by grace through Jesus Christ. So first off, uh, our need for reminders. The Corinthians, they'd lost sight not only of the gospel, they'd, they'd lost sight of Paul's place in their lives, and he's fighting for both. Because Paul is the missionary who came into Corinth when it was a completely pagan city. He was the first to bring the gospel to them. He was the first to bring hope to them. He had this, this profound place in the life as, as the founder of their church, as the one who led them to Christ. And yet, as time has gone on, other leaders and other teachers have come in, and some of them have been faithful, and some of them have been unfaithful, but many of them were more impressive than Paul. Um, Paul's, Paul's this short guy that was known for being a great writer, not such a great speaker. Uh, he's, he's this guy, he wasn't like the other apostles who, who got three, four years to walk with Jesus and to learn from him. No, he was a guy who, who came on the scene late. We'll see it later in the passage. He speaks of being one abnormally born. It seems that this was an insult that, that they had applied to him. It's like, Paul, you're like some apostolic miscarriage or something. You're, you're, you're deformed. You're, you're not legitimate. You're not, you're, you're not what the other guys are. And we've gotten a taste of real preachers. And we've gotten, we've gotten a taste of real leadership. And we have no place for you anymore. And yet again, the people who have replaced him as these roles of influence in their lives, they weren't faithful. And so Paul is coming in and he is, he is fighting both for his place of influence in their life and even more so he's fighting for the doctrine that he originally gave them, the true hope that they had in Jesus. He's saying, I want to remind you of, of what you have lost sight of. So he begins, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. This message of hope, this message of redemption, that though our sins be as scarlet, he, he will make us white as snow. 
Uh, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us in the midst of our rebellion, knowing that, that we would continue in our rebellion. While we were the enemies of God, he died in order that we might be reconciled to him, in order that we might be transformed. It's this message that we are done with doing better and trying harder and that we have thrown ourselves once for all on the mercy of Jesus Christ. That that we've looked at our lives, we've looked at our sins, and we've agreed with God that in ourselves we are hopeless. So so we're not trying to to rearrange our filthy rags of righteousness to to cover up our nakedness and our sin. No, we're, we're throwing it all off. We're throwing ourselves on the mercy of Christ and we're saying, if I am ever going to stand, if I'm ever going to be clothed in righteousness, if I'm ever going to look good in the eyes of God, then I'm going to need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Nothing short of that will do. He says, if I'm ever going to stand, then I am going to stand in the righteousness of Christ, not on my own merit. He says, this this gospel on which we've taken our stand, it it brings to my mind Martin Luther. When he began the Reformation, when he began the, the, the return of the church to this true gospel message. And he was attacked for it. And he was rebuked for it. And he was brought before this church council that that wanted to um, revoke his place as a leader among the church. And they said, hey, hey, buddy, all you have to do is recant. All you have to do is turn away from the gospel. And you can go on. You can have a good life. You can be a leader. You can have influence. You can have prestige. And he said to them, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. That's what Paul wants to remind them of. That they received a hope that was worth dying for. That they, that they received a, a hope that was worth living for. And yet they've lost sight of it as they've been, begun to pursue all the, all the little tangents and doctrines that these others taught. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. He says, I'm reminding you because you need reminding lest we forget, lest we lose hope, lest the fire of our conviction grows cold and we walk out into this world like ordinary men, like men and women who know nothing of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, who know nothing of the power of his resurrection, who know nothing of the power of his Holy Spirit to transform us. Guys, if you lose sight of the gospel, then how are you going to respond to sin? When temptation comes, you're going to feel weak. You're, you're going to, if you don't remember the gospel, you forget that, that Christ has died for your sin, not, not only to destroy its penalty, but to destroy its power. He says you've got to remember, lest you live like mere men, lest you allow sin to be your master and forget that its power is broken. Lest you forget that you have a better hope in Jesus than you could have in money, sex, or power, validation, affirmation. Anything that the world could give us. We're, we're these people who, who live our lives, again, trying to be validated by the world. Like, oh, what I can accomplish in the classroom, what I can accomplish on the athletic field, the things that I can do that will impress my parents or the people setting next to us, as though that will build us an identity, as though that will give us stability and significance. And he says, No. You're never going to get a validation that is going to speak as loudly and as truly as the God of all creation declaring you to be his son or his daughter. He reminds us of the unique hope that we have in Jesus Christ that we simply cannot find anywhere else. We remind each other because we need reminding, lest we drift away from the hope that we have in Jesus Some of us also need reminding as a warning. Paul continues in verse 2. But this gospel, by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. In this moment, Paul's being brutally honest about the reality. um, That some of us, even who have gathered here today, are simply going through the motion. Um, now, now, some of you, you haven't decided what you want to do with Jesus. You know, welcome to Mosaic Church. It might take time to figure that out. For others, um, 
it's a little bit more of a game. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of this accessory that you put on like, like a Sunday hat. And he, he says there's just the reality. For some of you, you're, you're kind of going through the motions of your parents' faith or your spouse's faith or, or your friend's faith. But that, that faith has never really held any meaning for you. you. You've never thrown yourself on the mercy of Jesus Christ. You've never, you, you've never seen the beauty of Jesus Christ. You've never seen just the ugliness of your sin and turned from it. And he says, there's just this reality that, that you can go through the motions and I can't tell. Um, you know, you can just kind of muscle it up and uh, try to be a good person and you know, say the right things, learn some Bible verses, sing the songs, whatever, and, and I can't tell. But there's this reality that, that if your faith is, is something that you're kind of borrowing from somebody else, if your faith is not real to you, then the time is going to come when, when trials come and testing comes and, um, and opportunity to fall into sin comes or persecution comes or just when, when, you're, when even the faith that you think you have is just rocked by desperately horrible circumstances that come in a fallen world. He says, some of you are going to see those trials, those temptations, those hardships as, as something that, that shows you just how empty you are and it drives you to Jesus Christ and you fall, you fall on him. And others are going to say, well, God, if, if you're going to give me this lot, then I don't need you. And you're going to walk away. And he's going to say, okay, despite the fact that it looked like you to believe, despite the fact that you went through the motions, there wasn't a genuine faith there. Whatever believing you were doing, it was, it was believing in vain. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain, uselessly, inadequately, half-heartedly. So he reminds us to take warning. But even in this warning, we see this invitation again to run to Christ, to cling to Christ, to hope in Christ. To pray that he would give us a faith that is, that is deeper and that it's more real. We remind each other because we need reminding lest we drift away from the hope we have in Jesus. We remind each other as a word of warning lest our faith be something casual and superficial and less than real. Finally, we remind each other of our vital opportunity to share the hope that we have. Look at verse 3. He says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Again, faith is not an accessory that clutters our lives. He says that faith is, is the essential element of our lives. It's the air that we breathe. It is the blood that flows through our veins. It is our lifeblood. And he says he has placed us in a world, a broken world, full of broken people who are bleeding out. And they need this lifeblood. So what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That's what he says. And, and what we receive, he wants us to pass on to others as of first importance, that we would share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We remind each other because we need reminding, but what are we reminding each other of? What is our message? What is our hope? What is this treasure that's been entrusted to us? We see more in verse 3. He says, For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Above all else, we proclaim the death of Jesus in our place for our sins in fulfillment of God's promises. And I would love to track through a ton of those promises. I, I narrowed it down to three verses I want to share from Isaiah 53 that, that call on the same language that's used in this passage. Isaiah the prophet says, Surely, speaking of Jesus, surely he took up our infirmities. And again, speaking of Jesus, 800 years before Jesus was born. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Above all else, we proclaim the death of Jesus in our place for our sins in fulfillment of God's promise. 
He is the sacrificial lamb that was slain for us. He is the fulfillment of all the foreshadowing of every sacrifice offered in the New Testament. He died for our sins, again, not just to pay the penalty for our sins, but to break the power of sin. Again, that sin would no longer be our master, that we could live free from our sins. And that's why Paul is so continually frustrated in this letter, because he's he's preaching, he's speaking, he's writing to a church that's continuing to live in sin. He says, I want to remind you that Christ died so that you could be free from the power of sin, so that you could be Free, so you could have the ability to resist temptation. So that you could hope in something better than the fleeting pleasure of sin. But he looks around the congregation, he says, you're like dogs that continue to return to your vomit. And you lick up that vomit and you take it back into your system until it makes you sick and makes you vomit again and it's making me sick. So he comes to them and he says, I want to remind you. I want to remind you of what you have in Christ, that your sins have been forgiven, that the power of sin has been broken. He says, my brothers, please let me remind you that Christ died for your sins so that you could die to your sins. And I know that many who have gathered here this morning need to hear that reminder as much as, just as much as the original audience. Um, Often we come into the Christian life And um, we see the beauty of Jesus and we're drawn to Jesus and we want to live for him and we want to know him and we want to pursue him. But over time, uh, that that heat, uh, that gospel heat, that gospel fire, it grows cold. And, And we just start going through the motions and the sins that used to entice us and that we used to love, they, they begin to feel a little bit more attractive again and, and we indulge a little bit and we're like, well, you know, that wasn't so bad. I, I turned, I repented, I went back to church, you know, I'm, and we just start to live this, this dual life you know, where we've got one foot in the church pursuing, pursuing Jesus Christ, we've got one foot in the world and just, just kind of looking for comfort and satisfaction and release and escape and validation and affirmation and whatever else in our sin. Guys, Christ did not die so that you could live with one foot chasing after him and one foot in the world. It's a horrible way to live. And some of you, you're like in the early stages of it, and you feel like, no, this is sustainable, this is working. Some of you guys, you're, you're, you're in the latter stages of it. And, and sin has already taken you further than you wanted to go, and it's kept you longer than you wanted to stay, and it's costing you more than you imagined that you could ever pay. And you don't feel like you can escape. You don't feel like you can do anything about it. There are these scriptures that maybe you memorized as a kid that says that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. God, the Holy Spirit, will provide a way out and strength that you can turn away from temptation. And you believed it when you were a kid, but your life experience is so riddled with sin, it's so overpowered by sin that you don't believe that the power of sin has been broken in your life. And again, I don't know what your sin is. I don't know if it's pornography. I don't know if it's anxiety. I don't know if it's pride or whatever it is. Some of you believe that, that, that you are captive to this sin and that nothing could be done. And so Paul comes and he, he reminds us that Christ died for our sins. Again, not just to pay the penalty for our sins, but that we might be freed from our sin. And it's a message to all of us. It's a message of hope. It's a message of encouragement. The Bible's never telling you run away from sin because God is trying to take something good from you. The Bible is is, is telling you to run away from sin in the same way that your parents are are, are telling you as a four-year-old, don't play in the road. It's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. This isn't going to end well. It's a message of life and hope and peace to say that the power of sin has been broken in your lives and to invite us all to live free from it. Jesus died for our sins. He died for your sins so that you could die to your sin. Jesus died for our sins so that we could die to our sins, and he rose that we could live to him, so that we might live for him, so that we might be his body, his hands and feet in the world. Verse three again, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. 
that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, which is further evidence that he was truly dead. That he was raised on the third day according to the scripture, again in fulfillment of his promises. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and and then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And he says this to the first century church as if to say, if you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, go talk to one of these 500 people. They'd love to tell you all about it. Then he continues, then he appeared to James. And then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Again, the Corinthian church had come to see Paul and his leadership as weak and inadequate. Especially to compare to guys like Peter and Apollos and these great leaders and these great speakers. So it seems that they'd come up with this phrase to describe him, abnormally born. Again, stillborn, aborted, um, born with defect. It's this, that Paul, you're just not legitimate. You're lousy. We thought you were good when we didn't know anything better, but, but compared to the other leaders, compared to the other preachers, compared to the other apostles, you are weak and inadequate. You're a, you're a miscarriage of an apostle. They considered this an insult, something that they, could, that they could use to mock him and to put him down and to belittle him. Paul considered this a badge of honor. They're like, hey, all these other apostles, they had three years with Jesus. They actually learned from him. You're just winging it. You don't, you don't, you don't even know what you're doing. You're just this short guy with a speech impediment that has nothing to offer us. And again, they, they looked at it as as something that they were using to beat him up and to show that his ministry was invalid. Paul looked at it as a badge of courage, badge of honor. Yeah, I'm inadequate. Yeah, I'm short. Yeah, I've got a speech impediment. Yeah, yeah. if, if we're looking at my qualifications, then I'm not fit. If we're looking at my righteousness, it's filthy. If we're looking at my qualifications to be your pastor, to be your leader, then I should not be here. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, I'm completely inadequate. I'm completely messed up. I'm completely useless in myself, and yet God has made me useful for his glory. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and my weakness is the very thing that shows his power. They thought it was an insult. Paul knew that it was to the glory of God. He goes on to talk about his, his resume. He says, he says, for I'm the, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And he says, you think I'm inferior, you think I'm inadequate, that I don't deserve to be an apostle. You're right, I don't. He says, my resume is shameful. For most of my life, I've done more harm than good. He says, I've killed people for worshiping Jesus. That's my past, and even today, I'm still wretched and wicked and weak. But you think this disqualifies me, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you are what you are. What are we? Those of us who are in Christ, we're children of God. Adopted sons and daughters. We are, we are heirs of the kingdom. Though we are still sinners, though we are still wretched, though we are still weak, we have been declared to be saints. This not of our own merit, but by the sheer grace of God. And the same grace that saved me is the grace that sustains me. Again, some of you feel weak and feeble and simply incapable of living the Christian life. There's like a desire that you have to glorify God, but when Monday morning comes, this, there is not strength to match your desire. The, the same temptation comes, and, and there's, this, there's this moment where you want to resist, but then Then you just give way and and sin floods over you again and knocks you back again and beats you down again and you see no other answer, you see no other hope, you see no way out. Your lusts are strong and your courage is weak. 
and you fall to temptations more often than you stand. And the call to live like a saint, it just feels no more practical than if I told you to to lift up this building with one hand. It feels completely impossible and simply demoralizing to be reminded of the call. And yet, if you are saved by grace, then you are sustained by that same grace, and you can stand in that grace. The same grace that saved the Apostle Paul can save you. The same, the same grace that transformed Paul can transform you. Think of, think of the weakest Christian you can imagine. The most pathetic little sheep in all the flock of Jesus. The most timid, the most fearful, the most, the most inadequate and beaten down disciple. Jesus comes to that person. Jesus comes to you. Jesus comes to me. He says, by the grace of God, you are what you are. And let me remind you what you are. Again, that you're a child of God, that you have been infused with the Holy Spirit of God. The same God who spoke the world into creation has come to live in you. The same God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead has come to live in you. The same God who took this murderous maniac named Paul who hated the church, transformed him into a man who loved the church and was willing to die for the church. And you look at your sins and you you look at your own wretched heart and you're like, oh, I could never be different. I could never be changed. I've tried. It doesn't work. Well, it was never about your effort. By the grace of God, you are what you are. By the grace of God, you will be what you will be. If transformation is going to come, it's not going to be by you muscling up. It's going to be by you falling on grace and saying, God, please do in me what you've done in others because I cannot do it myself. Amen? By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I have potential to be what God has called me to be. What if I hate who I am? What if I'm not a follower of Jesus, or at best, I'm one of those half-hearted followers that we talked about before, that, hey, when trials come, when temptation comes, I walk out the back door and hope nobody notices. What if, what if I hate what I am? What if this declaration that, that by the grace, I am, <laughs> grace of God, I am what I am, feels like a sentence of death? If that's your situation, then again, we pray that God would change us by his grace. He changed me, he can change you. One of the, one of the ongoing refrains of, of, of the gospel stories is, is this linking of, of tax collectors and sinners, prostitutes and sinners, that the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, ahead of, ahead of the legalists, ahead of the people who trusted in their own righteousness. And I believe that that Jesus continues to highlight that group, not because he had anything against tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, whatever, but just to say to all of us that you're never going to be beyond his grace. And that if he can redeem others, he can redeem you. He's the one who opened our blind eyes to see the beauty of Christ. He is the one who gives us faith, and he is the one who sustains that faith by grace, by the grace of God, we are what we are. And so there's this implicit call that we continue to lean on grace. Um, there's, there's this myth or this, this foolishness in the church that we're saved by grace, but then we're sustain, sustained by all of our good effort. You know, we're, we're, we're saved by grace, but we keep ourselves in God's good graces by doing better and trying harder. And that's simply not the case. Uh, the old hymn, Come Thou Found, it says this, O oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Every day we're leaning into his grace. O oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Um, there's, this, there's this myth, there's this false teaching that we tend to believe, again, that, that we begin with grace And then we spend the rest of our life working off that debt of grace by doing better and trying harder. But Robert Robertson, whoever he is, the guy who wrote this hymn, 
you got it right. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. I always need God's grace. Even as I work, even, even as I labor, Paul says, that is, that's not me, but that is God's grace working in me. So today I come to church with, with 42 years of debt to grace. And I'm not going to spend my next 42 years, if God gives them to me, paying off that debt of grace. No, I'm going to spend the next 42 years going ever deeper into debt to grace. Because if there is anything ever good in me, it is going to be in me by the grace of God. If there is a good desire, if there is a good impulse, if there is love for my wife or for my children or for any of you, it is because God in his grace stepped into my black selfish heart and said, I am going to put something good in there. And it is going to be by grace. And you will daily be a debtor to grace and you will never pay off that debt. And God will never expect you to pay off that debt because he is a good father who simply wants to lavish you with his grace. Amen? You do not pay off your debt to grace through good works, but rather you continue to owe a greater debt to grace every day as God's grace moves you to good work. And that's what Paul says in these closing verses. He says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace was not without effect. This grace was not given to me in vain. He says, no, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Grace is not opposed to work. It's it's a question of motivation. It's it's, it's a question of order. It's a question of how those two are interconnected. Grace is not opposed to work. In fact, true grace always works. It compels us. It drives us. It works itself out in every area of our lives. It works itself out in humility. So that as we see God's grace in our lives, it changes the way we look at others. When we see a brother or sister in Christ that is held captive by sin, there's a temptation to judge. There's a temptation to criticize. There's a temptation to elevate ourselves and to look down and be frustrated. Well, what's wrong with you? Pick yourself up by the bootstraps like I did and get on with this thing. Let's live the Christian life. We see a brother who is struggling in sin, we're tempted to criticize. But, but grace humbles us. Calls us to say, but for the grace of God, so go I. When, 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 when we see our brother caught in sin and we see that we're not caught in sin, we should, say, we should say with David, God, why have you looked on me with such favor? Who am I that you would lavish me with your grace, that you would free me from this temptation while my brother still struggles? The grace of God, it it humbles us in a way that gives us optimism about others. When we see how God has been gracious to us, that he has redeemed us, that he continues to redeem us, that he continues to transform us, that he continues to accept us and love us in spite of us, that should give us great hope for everyone around us. You will not meet someone this week that is beyond God's grace. I don't care if they're the academic of academics and they're just like so atheist you can't imagine them coming to Jesus. I don't care if they're the most destitute of of drunken homeless guys on the corner. You will never meet somebody who is beyond God's grace. As God's grace works itself out in our lives, it humbles us to say, if God can show his grace to me, if God can redeem me, then, then all bets are off. He can redeem anyone. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you can be too. God's grace helps us to love. God's grace humbles us. God's God's grace gives us hope and optimism for everyone around us. When we see a lack of virtue in our own lives, God's grace drives us to hope and to perseverance and to prayer again, that God's grace might still win the day in our own lives. Amen? Let's pray.
Lord, we just live in a community that's, um, that's pretty driven towards accomplishment and resumes and climbing academic ladders and corporate ladders and all these things. Lord, I pray for those in this body who have attained much by worldly standards. God, I pray, I pray that you would give them a humility that would genuinely say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Um, God, for those who, who feel broken by sin, I pray you would give them a hope that would say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Lord, I pray that we would not compete with each other, that we would not beat one another down, that we would not compare ourselves to one another. But Lord, I pray when we see our brothers struggling, that we would, that we would meet them with the same compassion that we would want to receive and that we would show them your grace. Lord, help us to be a people who remind each other regularly of the grace of the gospel and of the hope that we have in you and who call each other to work harder like Paul worked harder, not to earn anything. Oh, but that we, that we would just know the joy that you offer for your glory. Amen.